you only get to win the first championship once. And for us to do it in a year where Houston suffered such devastation, it's something that will live forever for us. When we were losing, fans would walk by my box after the game and say, hey, Luno, fix this. So, you know, you get feedback all the time when things aren't going well. I went to go grab some Chinese dinner and they gave me a fortune cookie. And I usually don't even open them, but I decided to open it. And it said, if you maintain your course, you will accomplish your goal. And it's still there, quite frankly, because we haven't accomplished our goal. But uh, it ke it's just a little reminder that keeps me inspired. Jeff Luno, welcome to Baseball Stories. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for doing this. Now, uh, Jeff's always reminded me, guys, that he used to read me when he was at Penn. And so, Jeff, first off, thanks for making me feel old. <laughs> really much appreciated. Uh, and you can confirm now that sure. I was the one who inspired you to get into baseball. Is that right? Well, I spent eight years <laughs> in the Philly area, and I followed the Phillies during those years, and I read a lot of your work. And I don't know if that was my ultimate inspiration, but it certainly kept me interested. <laughs> okay, thank you. He totally made that up, but I, I appreciate that. We, we will get into your inspiration for how you got into baseball later, but we should talk about the World Series. Here's a ground ball right side, could do it. The Houston Astros are world champions for the first time in franchise history. This was no ordinary World Series. This was the first time your franchise had ever won the World Series. It's the first time your city had ever won the World Series. And it was a city that had just been ravaged by a hurricane. So how life-changing was it for the people that you work with and the city that you play in? I think it was life-changing for everybody. The players that were involved, certainly anybody involved with the organization, but Still, to this day, every day I run into people who come over and say, you have no idea what a big deal that was. You only get to win the first championship once. And for us to do it in a year where Houston suffered such devastation from Hurricane Harvey, the biggest natural disaster potentially in the history of our country, really meant a lot to the city, to the people, to us, to the players, to everybody. And it's something that will live forever for us. You know, I've talked about this many times. These are not sporting events. These are life events. Yeah. These are life-changing events. And when you looked in, when you rode on the parade floats and you looked into the eyes of those people, could you see how life-changing it was? I could. I, did, I had no idea there were that many Astros fans and that they, there were that many people that had Astros shirts that would show up for <laughs> a, a parade. It was really incredible. And you could tell they'd lined up for hours. They were waiting just to get a glimpse of Carlos Correa or Dallas Keuchel. And it was such an important moment for them. And, Beyond that, all the stories that people have told me about the fact that, you know, their their father, who's 90 something, they was able to finally get something that he's wanted his entire life, or their, you know, their kids have never seen a championship, and you know, Houston had two basketball championships, but no football and no baseball until yeah. this year, and uh, it's a big deal when you can do that. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, sports doesn't rebuild people's houses and rebuild people's lives, but right. it does offer hope and joy, and and, and you did that, and. You know, you said something last October that, that stuck with me. You talked about how you might not have made the Justin Verlander trade had it not been for that hurricane. Wanted to officially announce the acquisition of Justin Verlander to the Houston Astros. This is a major transaction, one of the largest transactions in our club history. We're very excited about it. I'm curious what you meant by that. Well, you never know the path you didn't take. <clears throat> but I will tell you that as we got closer to that August 31st deadline, and knowing what was going on back in Houston. Um, I pushed a little harder with the players I was willing to give up and it bridged the gap to a certain extent. But then it was up to Jim Crane to push harder on the money because I didn't have the authorization to cover what the Tigers were asking for. And at the end of the day, I remember he and I had a conversation probably about an hour before the deadline and we both recognized that this was the right thing to do, not only because we'd be acquiring a player that could help us win the World Series, but it was the right thing to do for our city and our franchise. And did we both push further than we would have? I think we did. 
and I think that was the right thing to do. Uh, and, and you know, people forget the timing of that trade was the same week as the hurricane, yeah. right? It was just, uh, like Justin's first day with your team was your first game right. back in Houston after the hurricane. So you, you felt the forces of that, I'm guessing, more powerfully and more personally than you might have. We did. I mean, it was all happening at that moment. We had our, our team. I stayed back in California to work on the deal. The team went to Texas and then uh, couldn't get into Houston, right. ultimately went to Tampa to play a series. Right. And, and players were worried about their families. I was worried about people I knew in Houston. All of us were very anxious at that time, not really knowing what the full long-term effect of this storm was going to be. Um, and, and Justin joined our team at exactly the right moment. We went back to Houston. We didn't play Friday night. We played a doubleheader on Saturday against the Mets. And, um, and he was there and immediately felt like he was part of what we were trying to do. Yeah, and just the, the whole saga is so incredible. And let, let me ask you a little bit about what this meant to you personally, mm -hmm. Jeff. Um, I mean, the way you built this team was not exactly traditional. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you did things that weren't necessarily popular in mm -hmm. your sport. Um, do you look at that World Series as a triumph of analytics, possibly? No, I don't. I look at it as, you know, Houston Astros uh, with a great effort starting when, you know, even before Jim Crane bought the team, but when Jim bought the team and hired me, we put a lot of effort into building the team to a point where we could compete for multiple championships. And I think it was validation that our approach was working, but we by no means feel like we've completed our task. Uh, and we did things a little differently than other clubs had done in the past. That's because that was the right approach for the Houston Astros, given our starting point and given our strengths and our weaknesses and what we wanted to accomplish. And uh, for us, it, it ended up being the right approach. It may not work for another team. Uh -huh. Well, let me put it uh, differently then. You think maybe it was a triumph for innovation? I do. Uh, for thinking outside the box, for taking risk, um, for you know being bold, all, all of those things, which you know obviously for us includes an emphasis on, on technology and information that maybe was a little more aggressive than other teams had done in the past. But um, it's, it, for us, it's, it's much more complicated than just any one uh, area. It's a combination of factors of leadership, of management, of technology, of innovation, um, and of, of, of getting human beings to all operate together towards a common purpose. This is a very traditional sport. Mm -hmm. So how hard has it been to be that guy, to have the courage to say, no, we're, we're not doing it that way? You know, one of the things that uh, I admire about you is you're one of those people who's never willing to accept this explanation that, well, this is the way we've always mm -hmm. done it. But this is a very traditional sport. Mm -hmm. So how hard has it been to be that guy, <laughs> right? To be, to have the courage to say, no, we're, we're not doing it that way. Uh, it's, it's difficult because of so much focus from the media and the fans and so much awareness of every decision we make. And when I was hired in 2003 as a vice president of the St. Louis Cardinals, one of the uh, criteria for the person in that job was to have a thick skin because Bill DeWitt Jr. knew that uh, I was going to be probably doing some things that were going to be unpopular. And if I reacted to the criticism, I would back off pretty quickly. I've learned to have a thick skin in baseball, but I've also learned that you know, there's a lot that we do in baseball that's done for a good reason, and history teaches us that these things are done uh, with the right objectives in mind. And so you can you have to be really careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, the way we teach, the way we develop, a lot of those things are correct. But there's other things, because the world changes around us, that baseball's been slow to adopt, quite frankly. And the teams that have been it, be able to innovate and adopt more quickly have gained a significant advantage. And you talk about the Boston Red Sox, the Cleveland Indians, the the New York Yankees, the St. Louis Cardinals, the, the list goes on. Those are all teams that are known for being ahead of the curve, and it's resulted in wins on the field. So for us, it's a, it's a no-brainer. Well, well, let me ask you this. Uh, even if you have that thick skin and you can somehow shut out the noise, mm -hmm. 
you have to have a lot of other people buy in. Sure. And how conscious do you think that they are of that noise? Uh, well, very conscious. Everybody reads uh, what the media is talking about no. and, and hears fans. Uh, yeah, fans, <laughs> ta fans tell us when we were losing, fans would walk by my box after the game and say, hey, Luno, fix this. So, you know, you get feedback all the time when things aren't going well. Uh, but I think if you communicate well to all the stakeholders, and that includes your ownership group, it includes the media, it includes the fans, it includes people in the front office, the players, the staff. I mean, that becomes such a big part of my job. You know, setting the vision, hiring the right people, but then over communicating so that everybody rem remains inspired and is able to uh, push through those times when the criticism is there because we can never control the outcome and sometimes the outcome doesn't happen the way we want it to. And you can't just decide because you've lost a few games in a row that all of a sudden your strategy is wrong. I mentioned how, how tough things were when you first got there. Uh, your team mm -hmm. averaged. 108 losses a year for three years. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. And, you know, I know people like to use that word tanking. Mm -hmm. I don't, personally, because mm -hmm. I think it's a sort of a radioactive word that people read all kinds right. of meanings into. But there certainly was an approach there. It, I mean, would you say that that approach was you, you recognize that as you looked at the system that by losing big, ultimately you could win big? No, it wasn't that. For us, okay. we inherited a team that had one of the bottom five farm systems in baseball and had the worst record in Major League Baseball. We didn't have a whole lot to work with. Now, that being said, Dallas Keuchel, George Springer, Jose Altuve were all in the system, so they were really important players that would become part of our future. But we could have tried to fix everything at the same time and spent an enormous amount of money doing it, and we would have had, uh, we would have had a lot of trouble. So what we decided to do is fix the process to develop the players so that we could consistently have a pipeline of great players to trade and to bring up to the big leagues. And that meant trading away guys like Carlos Lee, like Wandy Rodriguez, like Brett Myers, but accumulating guys like Joe Musgrove and Davinsky, who were in double A at the time, but who would eventually get to the big leagues. It did not mean in one, for one moment that we didn't try and win every possible game at the big leagues. And I was signing free agents that we could that we thought were good role players. Uh, we weren't gonna go out and sign big free agents to multi-year contracts because we knew that our probability of, of even losing less than 100 games was pretty remote. So it didn't make sense for us. And at the same time, our TV deal was falling apart. We didn't have the revenues that the other teams had. So we were responsible with the resources we had, executed the strategy that we felt would get us to the end point as quickly as possible. And quite frankly, that's exactly what happened. So when you hear people throw around that word tanking, uh, not just with your team, right. but with all teams, what, do you think that tanking exists or whatever? Well, it doesn't. It, I don't or? think it exists in, in baseball. Um, if you try to lose or even facilitate losing in order to get a number one draft pick, I mean, we're a great example of a team that has hit on some number one draft picks and not hit on others. So there's no guarantees that it's actually going to work. You know, obviously there's a there's a grievance now that was filed by mm -hmm. the union. Um, not again, your team was not a target, right. but um, so this this really is a topic. Um, do you have any concern that when uh, a significant number of teams are not trying to win, that that is a problem for your sport or any sport? I, I don't. Well, it would be a problem if they were not trying to win. But the reality is that we have several teams right now that were doing everything they could to win for the longest period of time possible and that's why they're in the situation that they're in where they suddenly have to break it apart and, and almost change strategy. You talk about you know teams like the Tigers, they went for it. They went for it every year. The Phillies went for it every year. The Miami kept, kept signing guys and going for it. And it got to the point where that just adding more free agents uh, is, was not going to solve the problem for them and they had to regroup and that's what's happening. And it just so happened that several teams are doing it at the same time but I don't, I don't think it's unhealthy for the sport. I think three or four years from now, uh, some of those teams are gonna be in the position we're in right now, and our job is to figure out how to stay where we are, because you look at uh, five years ago, the two teams that were in the World Series uh, are now picking first in the draft. So it was a pretty quick ride from top to bottom, and we, our goal is to avoid that ride. You come into the game as the scouting director. You've never scouted, you've never worked in baseball, how much resistance did you encounter from your scouts?
We are Houston proud. We are Houston strong. And we are the 2017 world champions. Let's talk a little bit about your personal journey because sure. it's unique. Uh, you were an economics and engineering major mm -hmm. at Penn. Sure. You got an MBA at Northwestern. And you didn't get into baseball till you were, what, 35 years old? Correct. 35 years old. Uh, like, don't you have to be the first general manager in history who went from petstore.com yeah. to winning the World Series? Oh, absolutely, no <laughs> question about it. I'll tell you though, you know, my experiences before I got into baseball have formed the type of executive that I am in baseball. And we've hired a lot of people from outside, uh, outside the industry in this front office and everybody brings a unique perspective and unique set of experiences that helps them and helps us. And I was an engineer working on a manufacturing line for a few years. I was a management consultant working for one of the top consulting firms in the world, working with large companies trying to solve really complex problems. I did two technology startups from the scratch where you start with a business plan, you raise money, and you start uh, getting traction. All of those have helped me in baseball in so many different ways. Uh, it, it, because baseball is a business and, and be, being a general manager involves managing people, it involves understanding technology, it involves understanding economics, um, and also obviously a deep appreciation of our game and how our game works. Your general manager, Jeff Luno. You come into the game as the scouting director mm -hmm. and you would never scouted, right. you never worked right. in baseball. How much resistance did you encounter from your scouts? Uh, you know, they were very polite and eager <laughs> to, to help us win. And there were a lot of, it was interesting because there was a, a group of folks that were just never going to accept me no matter what because of my background and I hadn't paid my dues. Uh, there was a group of folks that were saying, let's see how this goes. I'll, I'm curious to see how this works. And then there was a group of folks who were thinking, this is a great idea. <laughs> um, now. I, one of the things that I made sure of was that I didn't uh, pretend to know things I didn't know, right. right? I didn't know how to scout a player. I remember going out and seeing my first players in the draft. Um, I didn't know what I was looking at, and I was amazed that scouts could see things at the way they could. Now, I, I tried to learn as quickly as I could, but um, there's a philosophy that being a scouting director, being a farm director, being a general manager, you're managing the experts. And I knew I wasn't the expert. I knew it would be a long time before I was the expert. But I had 20 scouts who were experts at evaluating talent. And I knew that if I managed them properly, we could actually raise the output for the St. Louis Cardinals. And you know, starting in 2005, when I took over the draft, all the way through 2011, my last draft there, I would argue that the Cardinals' production in the draft through those years was higher than any other team in baseball, and potentially one of the most productive historic groups of uh, times in history of the game from yeah. the draft, but I didn't pick the players. I managed the group of experts and allowed them to pick the players in a way that made sense for the organization and added some capabilities, analytic capabilities, other things to the, to the equation that allowed us to minimize the losses and, and maximize our bets. Did you ever have any uh, knockdown drag outs with <laughs> some of these scouts who just didn't see your point of view? And well, uh, it, that, you know, that can't be easy. It's, but, it, but what you're doing is you're balancing different points of view. So you have a scout from the Northeast who thinks his pitcher should be taken in the second round, and you have a scout from California who thinks his high school outfielder should be taken in the second round. So you're really trying to get to the bottom of which, which player should be taken by your organization. And independent of, of the personal, uh, the, the, you know, the goals of each individual scout. So uh, it wasn't me saying that, you know, Joe Kelly was the guy we should take in the third round. I ultimately made the decision, but uh, it was me listening to the scouts and trying to figure out where the truth was in all the arguments that I was hearing. Right. And what, when Jim Crane interviewed you, what was he looking for? You know, the interesting thing is I, um, I came up with a plan. I prepared a 25-page paper, sent it to him, took a little bit of a risk because it was a bold plan. I wasn't sure it was in line with what he wanted. Um, and when we talked about it, I realized that it was very much in line with what he wanted. But sometimes having an owner say, yeah, we're going to take a bold approach, uh, that sounds great when you start. But a few years into it, if you're losing, he may not really support that approach based on all the criticism and if results aren't going exactly the way you want it to. But I got to give Jim a lot of credit. He stuck to it. In the darkest times, he doubled down on our strategy. And I, I got that feeling from him during the interview. I asked him during my interview, I said, what are my constraints? Because 
I figured there these people I would have to keep. This, you know, this is, and he had, I thought he had, he had a piece of paper in front of him. I thought it was, he had a list ready. He was prepared for the question. He ripped it off and tossed it across the desk and I looked at it and it was a blank sheet of paper and I still have it to this day, huh. which meant that we were going to do it the right way. There were no legacy constraints that were going to prevent us from executing the Houston Astros strategy. You know what's amazing is that wasn't so long ago and yet when you look up now it feels like everybody thinks this way. Everybody's trying to do what you did. Are you amazed by how, how fast the sport has transformed itself? I'm not. The pace of change in baseball is greater today than it ever has been in my opinion and it's because of the types of people that the owners are, the types of people the owners have hired to run their organizations, and also the amount of information and technology circling around the game. Our challenge is we had an advantage from 2011 to 2017 by some of the ways we did things, the innovation that we had, but now that a lot of teams have caught up, our challenge is how do we separate ourselves from the pack for the next five years? And that's something that keeps me up at night. It's something that uh, I work on constantly. Um, we spent a lot of time this summer knowing that we were going to have a team that had a good chance to go deep in the playoffs. We reorganized our entire baseball operations uh, organization in order to prepare ourselves better for the future. And kind of back to Bill DeWitt's philosophy of things are going well, it's actually the best time to make changes to prepare for the future because you can see things are going to change in the, in the future and I, I know they're going to continue to change in our industry. You know, it's easier to convince people it's the right way when you win, but of course Correct. when you got there, the opposite was happening. Correct. You were losing a lot and I, I, I know you've told this great story about going out to dinner and, and at a Chinese restaurant mm -hmm. and a fortune cookie yeah. provided that reassurance that you needed. Um, okay, yeah. I need to hear this again. Yeah, that was a great story. I was back in St. Louis. Uh, back feeling conflicted because this had been my home for so long and my organization for so long and they um, I went to go grab some Chinese dinner and they gave me a fortune cookie and I usually don't even open them but I decided <laughs> to open it and it said if you maintain your course you will accomplish your goal I stuck that fortune on my car dash and I looked at it every single day and it's still there quite frankly because we haven't accomplished our goal but uh, it ke it's just a little reminder that keeps me inspired. So you still have the fortune. I still have the fortune because we're not there yet. We've won a World Series and it was a great experience but our goal is to win a couple of those things. Jeff you've gone from outsider to World Series champion. Uh, it's really been an amazing journey so I'm, I'm glad you got to tell your story here on Baseball Stories. Thank you very much. Thank you Jason.